Well, hey, everybody, this is Heidi St. John. Welcome to the Heidi St. John podcast. I'm glad you guys have joined me here at the intersection of faith and culture. Today, I am honored and very excited to have June Hunt on the show. June is the founder and chief servant officer of Hope for the Heart. She has a book called Domestic Abuse, Keys for Living. And you, many of you have heard my story of growing up in domestic abuse. This is a conversation that is near and dear to my heart. Stick around. I think you're going to be encouraged. Well, for everybody who's brand new to the show, I want to give you a warm welcome. Thank you for leaving reviews for us over at iTunes and for sharing this podcast with your friends. The issue of domestic abuse comes up in the church, but not nearly enough. And uh, I grew up in the 70s uh, in a very, very unhappy home. Many of you know that I am one of six sisters and a brother. And we, I went to a Christian school. And for the entire 18 years that I was going to that Christian school, we were living in sometimes unspeakable conditions at home. And I have a very tender heart toward this. I get lots of letters from women who are living with domestic abuse or women who are trying to get out of it or they're trying to help a friend walk through this uh, in a way that brings hope and healing. June Hunt knows what she's talking about. I first heard her speak over 10 years ago uh, when I went to hear Kay Arthur at a Women in Leadership uh, Summit, and I was just blown away by her heart for women. You guys are going to love her too. June, my friend, welcome to the show. Oh, I'm so excited to be with you, Heidi. I'm thrilled. Thank you. Well, I am thrilled as well. I'd love to start off by uh, introducing, allowing you to introduce yourself to my audience. This is the first time that you've been on the show. And um, to many of them, you'll be a new voice, although you've been in this space for quite a long time. Tell us a little bit about uh, your background and why this topic is so important to you. Hmm. Uh, I grew up uh, in a painful home because my dad had three families going on concurrently all at the same time. And uh, we were actually called, my mom and my siblings, we were called the Wright family, W-R-I-G-H-T. I was June Wright. Uh, we had a fictitious last name because we were the third family. I didn't know there was a second family. Um, and uh, when I was 12, I remember we moved into my dad's home. And nine, no, 11 months later, uh, my parents married. And it's not like, oh, things got better. Uh, my my father's first wife had uh, died, and so now we were, I thought, family number two. Uh, you know, about 10 years later, a man came up to me and said, now you know you're my half-sister, don't you? And I said, mm-hmm. no, I wasn't aware. And he said, yes, there are four of us in Atlanta. And he was probably 10 years older than me, maybe 15. But um, no matter what, uh, I was quiet. I didn't speak because nobody in school had my situation that I knew of, and, and um, I just I felt nobody could identify with me. And so I was really very, very quiet. Um, then uh, after, uh, well, we Dad had laws like um, uh, children must not speak during dinner, uh, after dinner was over, he told me, you are a bad influence on your mother, so you will have no contact with her, which mm-hmm. crushed her. So I had no contact. In fact, then he extended it to my brother and two sisters. Uh, none of you will have contact with your mother. And mom didn't know what to do. She, By the way, he was 28 years older. Mm-hmm. So there was a huge difference. So it's more like and I thought, how how did mom get into it? And I thought, okay, her father died when she was four. So she really didn't have a father growing up. And I think dad was a father figure mm-hmm. of sorts. Um, he said, Christianity is a crutch. Uh, he said, I'm not a Christian. I don't have to go by Christian ethics. And um, I confronted him about his women. And, you know, he said, I'm not a Christian. I don't have to go by Christian ethics. And he said, besides, your mother is mentally ill. Now, that that all of a sudden inflamed me. And um, 
I was not real smart. I said, well, had it ever occurred to you that you might be the one mentally ill? That did not go over well. No, I, I imagine I, not. I, no, I was not smart. And so I was beaten. But really, you know, I just, I said, hell will freeze over before I shed a tear. I will not shed a tear. And because I was angry with how he treated her, how he, he would, how, she was sweet. She was always kind. Never tried to turn us against him. Um how how could how could anybody treat somebody who's so kind and uh uh so it, it it was so hard because he used this mental illness thing and one time he saw me with tears and he said you are mentally ill and uh and and he said tears are a sign of mental illness well i i knew that wasn't true but Heidi, I didn't know what to do, and so um, thank God that he ended up moving us from a church that we we were in church. That was Mother's only non-negotiable, mm-hmm. but had Heidi, there was no Bible. It's a mainline denomination. Wow. I went to Sunday school and to the church service. Well, there was they always said the Lord's Prayer. That's that's all I ever heard. No so Bible. I, no, and and it it's un, inconceivable knowing what I know now. I mean, I ended up being in a church that was biblically based as a high school student, and I thought all all these teenagers they I mean they go go and they're there. How do they even? I thought no tabs. How do they know? How, right. So I was fascinated, and finally was drawn. To whatever they had, see, I I knew I wanted what they had. What they had was a changed life through Christ. Yes. Uh, I thought they had information. No, they had transformation. But I didn't mm. even know that word. So I was so ignorant about everything spiritual, and so. Uh, but I I started living for Sundays, uh, even before I became a Christian, because I wanted the quality of life that they had. But of course, they knew nothing about my home life, and so. Bottom line is. Much later, I, uh, the pastor, uh, the way I say it, the pastor had a momentary uh, uh, strike, struck, strike of, 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 of mental illness of, because he hired me to be the youth, the junior <laughs> high director. There were 600 in the junior high division. Oh, my God. That's now, a big I church. No, it was, it was at First Baptist Church, Dallas. And then there later, after four years, I was the college and career director. And the leaders would say, don't worry about leading. We'll teach you how to lead. You're great with the kids. But see, I was compassionate. I, my heart went out when I would see a loner, when I would see someone silent. They couldn't mm-hmm. talk. Mm-hmm. I would know there's a reason why. And so it, I initially, Heidi, thought, how could God, who's all-powerful, allow one person to cause so much pain? Yeah. And I had no idea— and I, in fact, that was almost a stumbling block, keeping me from praying to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. But I thought, yeah, when, when I was exposed to how do you, what do you do? You, and you humble your heart, you receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, which I never heard of before. Allowing him to be Lord of your life, taking control of your life. And I thought, but why, if God is allowing this? And I thought, all I know is they are telling me that you have a changed life through Christ. And I did. I, mm-hmm. And and later, 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 uh, I, because my heart went out to those who were hurting, uh, especially, then uh, somehow I ended up doing a radio program called Hope for the Heart. Didn't want to be on radio, didn't plan on it, but... Uh, and I'll tell you what did happen. I could not understand. How could there not be any material Christian? Yep. Okay, how can there not be a Christian book on childhood sexual abuse when the statistics are one in three girls, one in five boys? How, uh, domestic violence? I, th- I think I only found one book at the time, Christian book. And it's not that I found it. It's just I think it one existed. And so... There was this huge void. I fortunately loved, I learned to do Bible study, and I was 
teaching uh, a singles large large singles class and and uh, but uh, all of a sudden now I'm teaching a course called Counseling Through the Bible, meaning to to write material that didn't exist. Well, not some of it existed on parenting and marriage, um, on certain topics, but there were all these other topics that there's no material on. So I did a course. Uh, at a Bible church, large Bible church on Monday night and Tuesday morning. All these people came, and my objective was definitions, characteristics, causes, and solutions on basically, it was a, basically 100 topics. And because I thought there are biblical principles for anything in life. Yes. And so that's kind of, I think it's that I look for holes, holes that need to be filled. And people don't need to be hitting potholes in life. They don't want to. But we we know, you and I know, that God has solutions. There are answers. If we are if we look at the the key is look at the whole counsel of God. Yes. And that's what was not going on in certain with certain topics. Yeah. And I and honestly I think this is how come abuse has become so common in the church. Uh, we we have run from it. This was certainly the case when I was growing up in the 70s. The only thing we ever heard about uh, with regard to any kind of abuse in the home was wives are supposed to submit to their husbands. Just a full stop, right? That's submit it. to your husband. And the, that was the end of the discussion. But domestic abuse is very prevalent in the culture right now. What mm-hmm. constitutes domestic abuse and how prevalent is it? Hmm. This is what is stunning. And you and I met. Well, at least this is my first time I remember meeting you. Was, <laughs> I was I, I was rather forgettable when you saw me the first time. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I know you're not forgettable, but uh, <laughs> but the the point is we interacted, and I uh, at the Ark Encounter. Yes. And we, I, and I remember uh, speaking, saying, domestic violence is so prevalent. It's one in three women worldwide. I remember being in Dallas a decade before that, and I saw a statistic, the first time they ever did a statistic of worldwide, uh, and it was one in three women. But if you look at the, in the United States, even today, it's one in three women worldwide. So domestic violence, uh, it, it's a persistent pattern of coercive Forceful acts, it's not just a one-time uh, event, uh, but forceful acts by a man toward his wife, or sometimes it's broken into also a girlfriend. But 95% of women, uh, of vi- 95% of victims are women. Um, and it affects everyone in the family. It bridges all levels of society. It's not just the underprivileged or anything like that, uh, but economic, geographic, uh, racial, religious, uh, all levels. Uh, it undermines the value of those who are victims, and it seeks to dominate. Control is the name of the game, and if not stopped, it escalates in intensity. But it's th- this is important. It's not a matter of just, well, we need to get this couple into uh, marriage counseling. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Because if she is verbal about what's happening, she will pay. It will be, she, she will be, um, have to, he will retaliate at home mm-hmm. when it's that. Mm-hmm. In other words, it's not an issue of conflict resolution. And it's never the fault of, the woman. Uh, now, there are women who can lash out, but to to violently or to be abusive is a whole nother issue. And by the way, if it is not dealt with, it will not go away. It will only uh, escalate in intensity. But the good news is this. He heals the brokenhearted. This is what I love about the promise in Scripture. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Uh, I used to have a, whatever I 
whenever I was writing a letter, it wouldn't matter what it would be. Content was what one thing. What I would always close with as a P.S. was uh, it's uh, Psalm thirty four eighteen. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted yeah. and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Mm. So my objective is Jesus came to set the prisoner free. And there can be those who feel imprisoned in their own homes. So we have a ministry called Hope for the Heart. We have a hundred different topics. This is just one of them. But I love it when I'm asked to speak on this topic because what happens is afterwards, it's like they're hearing words they have not heard before. Mm -hmm. And the whole point is to be biblical. Um, and if, if I could just piggyback on something you said in your home life, yes, uh, women are told, wives, submit to your husbands. And my sister, um, we cancel out each other's votes. I'll put it that way. I understand. <laughs> now, she said to me, June, I can't be a Christian like you and mother. I said, why do you say that? She said, I don't believe the Bible. I said, what do you not believe in the Bible? And she said, I don't believe wives submit to your husbands. Mm -hmm. And then she said, look what dad did to mother and look what mother did. All she did was submit. And then I said, well, you know that there's a literary law. I said, since you're an author, you know there's a literary, literary law. Context is king. Mm -hmm. What the words before or after, they're very important. Maybe the chapter or even the theme of the book. And she said, well, yes, of course, I agree with you on that. I said, well, the verse right before wives submit to your husbands is submit one to another out of reverence for Christ. So I said, so there must be mutual submission, submit one to another. And then I said, three verses later, it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So he must be willing to die for her, yes. not her die at his hands. And she said, oh, my God, are you serious? The Bible really says that? And yes. I said, yes. So there's a misunderstanding of Yes, there is a scripture, wives, submit to your husbands, but there's also submit to the governing authorities. Well, Heidi, in America, is it permissible for, by, by law for, for domestic violence to take place? Is it permissible? No. No, no. We have laws against it. That's right. So if we're to submit to, to the governing authorities, then you'd, but, and, I, and I said to my sister, but let's say... You're in a country where there is no law against domestic violence. Then what? And she was looking at me. I said, there's a higher, there's a hierarchy. And that is, we must obey God rather than man. Mm -hmm. And when I was in Russia, I never will forget, there's a reason why I did this. I looked up all of the verses in the Bible, because they had no law like this. I looked up every verse against violence. Not one was ever right in God's sight. So those who are taught that women must submit to violence in their homes, uh, they are wrong. They're, being, they're not being biblical at all because mm -hmm. nowhere in the Bible is that right in God's That's sight. That's right. That's right. And a wrong understanding of Scripture will always lead to a misapplication of Scripture. And that's why it's so sad when you see uh, pastors making excuses for violence in the home or, you know, falling back on a verse without the understanding or without wanting to study that passage in context. This isn't something that uh, I think is talked about a whole lot. I don't, I don't see it really even on Christian radio. Dr. Dobson used to talk about it quite a bit. I remember listening to him when I was younger, one of the mm -hmm. few voices who really would start to, you know, openly talk about it. I heard him say one time that there was such a thing as a cycle of abuse. And I experienced this as a young girl, and I know you understand what it is. Can you talk about what a cycle of abuse is for listeners? You know, this is huge. And 
It's so helpful for every one of us to know this. Um, this is a pattern of three stages uh, where, where there's a cyclical occurrence when there is uh, the one who is abusive. Uh, the, the first is being, he, he gets agitated uh, over something relatively small. It's not a big thing. But he blames her, uh, and usually we're de just dealing with verbal and emotional abuse, but that creates fear in her. And he, she buys into the lies. If you had only done this, it's all your fault. Mm -hmm. uh, and so she's trying everything she can to appease him, whatever she can think of uh, that would please him or to divert attention. Um, Interesting, by the way, that Proverbs thirteen two says uh, the unfaithful have an appetite for violence. Okay, the ag agitated stage. I made them all all A's. Um, just, I love it. Alliteration. Yeah, We're going to get along just yeah. fine. <laughs> agitated <laughs> stage. The next is the acute stage, which is he erupts like a volcano, gives full vent to his rage. And now, this doesn't last long at all. Over time, these outbursts become more frequent and dangerous. And uh, Proverbs 29 says, An angry person stirs up conflict, but a hot-tempered person commits many sins. Mm. So now, the third stage is the apologetic stage. And this is called the honeymoon phase. Yep. He becomes... Humble, at least more humble, she becomes more hopeful. Uh, he's changed from being villainous, if you will, to virtuous. Uh, this dramatic, trans dramatic uh, transformation uh, is seen with tears and tenderness, uh, filled with possibly remorse, being sorry, could be romance. Uh, so she's looking at this because because there's apologies there's pleadings i will not do this again mm -hmm. not not this is not for all but there's a huge percentage that it's this way but tell me this how long do honeymoons last heidi not very long no nope, they're there for a period of time but not long because there's a vast difference between remorse and repentance yes. between regretting versus uh, changing behavior. And the Bible says godly sorrow brings repentance that leaves, leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. And I've always loved that scripture because it helps us be wise. Has there been true repentance that's 2 Corinthians 7.10. So if you're driving down a road and you turn onto a one-way street, but the wrong way, a repentant person has a change of mind with a change of direction. Um, you don't do well if you're going the wrong way on a one-way street. How wise, therefore, to truly repent mean a change of mind with a change of direction. Now, the the problem, though, is she if she's bought into, oh, he's changed, he's changed. Yes, he's changed temporarily. Sometimes it's just to get her back under his thumb. Uh, and some people, some will be sorry that they've done what they've done. But being sorry, it doesn't mean true repentance, mm -hmm. because if there's a re repetition, then there's not a true change of life. And so the issue is we need to be wise about what is lifestyle. Is this a one-time thing? No, not, not with domestic violence, not what we're talking about. It's a repeated pattern of um, making sure that she is under his control and his main concern is he does not want her to leave. 
he mm-hmm. he wants to keep her. Uh, there are some pluses that he has about having her in his life. And um, so he's got to make sure, though, everything is exactly according to his will, not necessarily at all being in God's will. That's really not uh, the, the, the focus. And as long as he can keep her under his thumb, um, he, this cycle continues on and on, over and over, except it becomes more dangerous. Thank you guys for tuning in today's interview with my friend June Hunt. As a as a as a woman who has lived this story, this was the first 18 years of my life. I can tell you right now that uh what she is saying is life-giving because she's taking women back to the word. God's heart is for you. It's not against you. And for any woman who's listened to this, who has been told that it is her responsibility to stay inside of an abusive relationship. This is a misunderstanding and a misapplication of not only the word of God, but a misunderstanding of God's heart toward you. So I hope you guys will check it out. Um, By the way, this is her book. For those of you who are watching this on YouTube or Rumble, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm going to encourage you to move away from that platform because I will be uh, putting most of my episodes, all of my episodes up on Rumble. I'm really tired of... uh, of YouTube's censorship. And so we are making a concerted effort to start moving this show over to Rumble where you guys can actually watch the unfiltered version. Also, you can find me at Jack Hibbs Real Life Network. So I hope you will check that out. I'm holding June's book in my hand, Domestic Abuse. Uh, There's no excuse for abuse. This is what it looks like. You can get it anywhere the books are sold. And she does an amazing job uh, in this book of just talking women through why it's not God's heart. She talks about the cycle of abuse, um, what it what it looks like to actually be abused. And as we're going to talk about tomorrow, I'm not talking to the woman who is just frustrated with her husband. All right. Uh, I'm not talking to I'm not I'm not suggesting that if you don't get along with your husband or if he yelled at you one day, that's abuse. No, we're talking about uh, systematic abuse and people who grow up in that situation or who are married to someone who is like that know exactly what I'm talking about. This podcast is for you. I am not making an excuse for women who are just generally unhappy to walk away from their marriages. We're talking about God's heart for women who are in abusive marriages or in abusive relationships. Uh, This applies to teenagers as well. I have seen this also where uh, young women get involved with very abusive men. and, uh, And this is not God's heart for you. So I hope you guys will find this book. It's written by my friend June Hunt. It's called Domestic Abuse. It's part of her Keys for Living library. She is one of my favorite voices on this topic. I'm going to come back tomorrow and during happy hour and share a little bit more of my own story growing up. I don't often do it at the show because I don't want this to be the focus of the Heidi St. John podcast. My my story, my life is a testimony to the healing power of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the healer and I know how loved I am because I've been saved and the Lord has done such a healing work in my life. It doesn't mean that there wasn't hurt and sorrow and not a lot and it, and a lot of work has had to be done uh, in my life to frankly recover from how I grew up. But I know that God has healing for you and I want you to experience it. It's found in Jesus Christ. June's going to come back tomorrow and she's going to continue to share more keys for living on the topic of domestic abuse. So I hope you guys will come back tomorrow. Thank you for sharing this podcast with your friends and for uh, supporting this ministry. Hope you'll check it out, Firmly Planted Family, and also check out my ministry at faiththatspeaks.com. Have a great day, everyone, and I will see you back here again tomorrow with part two of my interview with the beautiful Miss June Hutt here at the intersection of faith and culture.